Um, I'm Kathy. I switched to Zaki on the schedule, so that might be a little confusing. Um, and I'm very excited to be presenting here. I have fallen asleep in these lecture chairs many times, so now I get to return the favor. Um, I'm going to be talking about zero-knowledge proofs and bullet proofs, and this is what I've been working on for about the last like year and a half at Chain and then Interstellar. So I'm going to sh sort of share a little bit about what we worked on and teach you guys about um, how it all works, how the math works. So yeah, here's our roadmap. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about what are zero-knowledge knowledge proofs, just to set, oh, no. Oh. Um, let's plug this in. Hmm. Cool, all right. So here's the roadmap, thank you. Um, I'm going to first start by talking about zero-knowledge proofs. What are they? Um, how do they generally work? And then I'll talk about the Bulletproofs paper, which is one of many zero-knowledge proof protocols out there. Uh, later on today, Rebecca, I think, is going to talk about other kinds of zero-knowledge proof protocols. And then I'll talk about how you can build a range proof using Bulletproofs, and also how you can build constraint system proofs using Bulletproofs. And then I'll talk about what we at Interstellar have been building on top of these constraint system proofs. Uh, we've been building a confidential assets protocol and a zero-knowledge smart contract language and sort of open the floor for what anyone else might want to build using these constraint system proofs. So cool, that's the roadmap. Um, first of all, what are zero-knowledge proofs? So a zero-knowledge proof is a way to prove that a statement is true without revealing the secret that the statement is about. So that seems a little bit non-intuitive. How can you prove that something is true without you know, the verifier actually checking it explicitly? Um, and the way you can do this is using like, pretty interesting math. And a zero-knowledge proof must have several properties. First, if the statement is true, you should be able to convince someone that the statement is true with the proof. Uh, also, if the statement is false, you should not be able to convince someone that the statement is true using the proof. And it should be zero-knowledge, which means that anyone looking at the proof should learn nothing other than simply the truth of the statement itself. So um, one way just to get an intuition of how a zero-knowledge proof works is with this sort of visual example with Peggy the Prover and Victor the Verifier. So uh, Peggy the Prover has spent like hours and hours solving this Where's Waldo puzzle and she has finally found Waldo. And she wants to prove to Victor and just the world that she has done all of the work to solve this puzzle, but she doesn't want to just point to where Waldo is because then Victor the Verifier could take this knowledge and then pretend that he has spent hours and hours solving the puzzle and he could sort of tell everyone else. So that would be bad. Peggy wants to get credit for the work she's done without pointing to where Waldo is. So she uses a zero knowledge proof of knowledge. Uh, how she does this is she takes a large black sheet of paper. Uh, it just has to be twice the height and twice the width of the original Where's Waldo puzzle. So this large black sheet of paper has a little like silhouette cutout of Waldo. And then what she does is she lays this in front of her Where's Waldo um, puzzle. And if she can get the Waldo in the Where's Waldo puzzle to line up perfectly with this large black sheet of paper and the cutout silhouette of Waldo, then she can show Victor the right-hand side here. So Victor will see, yes, indeed, I see Waldo in the silhouette cutout. Therefore, Peggy must know where Waldo was. However, Victor doesn't know anything about the location of Waldo within the puzzle because regardless of where Waldo is in the puzzle, Peggy can get him to line up entirely with the little silhouette cutout, no matter what. So like, that's kind of an intuition. So basically, Peggy has proved to Victor that she knows where Waldo is because uh, if she doesn't know where Waldo is, she couldn't actually make it line up with the silhouette. But Victor learns nothing about the actual location of Waldo other than that uh, Peggy knows where it is. So this is a pretty good intuitive example. Uh, you can go to this Medium link, which shows a better, fuller explanation of this example. But you know, maybe that's not satisfying because this is extremely visual and you want to understand a little bit more about how the actual math works. So I'll dive a little bit into the Bulletproofs paper and then explain how the Bulletproofs paper achieves this zero-knowledge proof property. So what are bulletproofs? It's a paper about an efficient zero-knowledge proof system designed by Boons, Boodle, Bonnet, Polstro, Wheeler, and Maxwell that came out in about 2017. And it builds on techniques that were introduced by this Eurocrypt 16 paper. And for both of them, the thing that makes them extremely efficient is a very efficient inner product argument. 
Um, I won't explain too much about the inner product argument here, uh, but that is sort of the keyword of what allows you to do these proofs in O of log n uh, time. So, uh, why do we care about bulletproofs? There's like a lot of zero-knowledge proof protocols out there, but bulletproofs is actually like particularly cool because it has a constrained proof size, which is important for blockchains because you want everyone to receive the proof uh, and store the proof on the blockchain. So bulletproofs gives you O of log n proof sizes thanks to the efficient inner product proof. It also gives you fast verification, uh, not only because the math itself uh, can be verified quickly, but also because you can batch multiple proofs, which means you can actually verify multiple proofs together in, at the same time. And you can also aggregate proofs, which means you can take multiple proofs and squish them into one proof. So that's like a pretty nice quality. And lastly, you can actually um, have ad hoc logic using bulletproofs, which means that you can sort of write smart contracts or arbitrary logic um, that can be verified in a zero knowledge proof. And unlike ZK snarks, for instance, in bulletproofs, you don't have to do trusted setup for these circuits, uh, for these statements, and so you don't have to do a really complicated sort of setup ceremony. So that's why we care about this paper. Uh, what is this paper? So uh, one example, the sort of simplest case example that we have for how you can do an interesting proof using bulletproofs is with a range proof. So in a range proof, what you want to do is prove that a certain value v is in a certain range between zero and two to the n. So that's sort of the upper left-hand side of this really cool illustration. Um, and so I'm not going to walk through the math today, but the general idea, the intuition behind it is that you want to break this one statement, this v is in zero to the two to the n range, into several different statements. So you can see it, um, the right-hand side box breaks it into several statements, and then you expand that into multiple um, polynomials, add blinding factors, you know, it just gets crazier from there. Um, but the general intuition is first, Peggy the uh, prover has a secret value v and wants to prove that it's in a certain range. She makes a commitment, big V, which is in the bulletproof's case, a Peterson commitment to V, and then she makes a range proof for big V, and then she gives the range, the range proof, and the big uh, V commitment to Victor the verifier. Victor the verifier runs a certain um, predefined like math uh, over the range proof and then outputs true or false. So just to expand a little bit, when Peggy uh, gives the range proof for big V, that's actually a range proof that contains two statements. The first statement is proof that V, little v, the secret value, is in range. And then it's uh, a proof that big V is actually a commitment to little v. And you can do all of these pieces without revealing what little v is. So I know I'm going to totally gloss over this, but we actually have uh, really extensive math documentation at this link here where we wrote up all the notes on how this works. Um, so we implemented this uh, and uh, ran it over a 64-bit range proof verification, which is basically a proof that a value is between 0 and 2 to the 64. Uh, and within IFMA backend, it's 0.7 milliseconds. With AVX2, it's 1.04 mill milliseconds. So that's like pretty fast and pretty cool. And on top of this already highly performant implementation, you can, as I mentioned earlier, do batching and aggregation to basically combine multiple proofs to make um, them run faster together. So that's pretty cool. Um, so after we implemented this, we sort of thought, well, that's awesome that we have something that shows that Bulletproofs is highly performant, but it would be really nice if you could, instead of only being able to do a proof that a number is in range, if you can really do a proof of any statement that you want to put together. Uh, and that's how we decided to work further on bulletproof constraint system proofs. So before I talk about you know, what the proofs are, let's talk about what the constraint system is. So in a constraint system, you have two kinds of constraints, a multiplicative constraint and a linear constraint. And in the bulletproof setting, a multiplicative constraint is a multiplication of two secrets to make a third secret. So in uh, this slide, the orange letters are the secrets. In a linear constraint, you have um, a linear combination of variables where the coefficients a, b, and c here are uh, clear text, uh, open to everyone, scalars. And x, y, and z are all secrets. And then the implicit assumption for a linear constraint in bulletproofs is that the whole linear constraint is equal to zero. So that's just how the paper sets it up. And uh, we actually care about constraint systems 
because a constraint system is trivially reducible to an arithmetic circuit. And for those of you who've taken like theory of computation, you know that a circuit, um, arithmetic circuit or circuit satisfiability is an MP complete problem. And so what that basically means is that any efficiently verifiable pro program can be reduced to a constraint system. So anything you might want to make a proof over, you can represent using this system. And then a constraint system proof is a proof that all of the constraints in a constraint system are satisfied by certain secret inputs. Um, so we also have a few more notes about constraint systems at this link here. So um, one interesting thing that we actually came up with as an extension over the constraint system proof is a way to use challenges. So unlike other zero-knowledge proof protocols, bulletproofs requires no trusted setup. And what this means is you can actually select a circuit from a family parameterized by challenges, which means you can get and use random challenge scalars that come from your commitments to the secret um, secrets. And what this allows us to do is actually to have like semi-interactive uh, zero-knowledge proofs, which allows us to have smaller and more efficient constraint systems. And I'll actually walk you through one example that uses these challenges to um, make a really efficient constraint. So this is currently under research. Um, Cool, so now we have sort of these two building blocks. We have, you know, one, we have a constraint system where you can represent anything that's efficiently verifiable using this constraint system that has multiplications and additions. And second, we have this like interesting challenge protocol where you can get a random challenge scalar from the constraint system. So I'll walk you through an example of a shuffle gadget using these two ideas. So a shuffle gadget, um, in this example, we have A and B as the inputs and C and D as the outputs. And you want to make a gadget or um, a collection of constraints that basically forces C and D to be equal to a permutation of A and B. So these constraints should only be satisfied if A equals C and B equals D, or if A equals D and B equals C. In any other um, permutation, uh, this constraint should not be satisfied and the proof should fail. So how do we do this? Um, in the two input, two output case, you can sort of imagine hard coding these statements in. But if you want to generalize to an arbitrary number of inputs and outputs, what you can do is use equality of polynomials when roots are permuted. So you can say that a minus x times b minus x equals c minus x times d minus x. And this actually puts a constraint on a, b, c, and d that is true if and only if a and b are a valid permutation of c and d. And this also holds for generalizing to n inputs and n outputs. And this is true if and only if x is a random challenge scalar. So hopefully this is a good illustration of why uh, the challenge extension that we came up where you can get x from the constraint system is like a useful um, construction to have. And uh, I sort of leave it to the audience to come up with like there's actually a lot of ways, a lot of very interesting ways to do um, a shuffle gadget. And so you can probably brainstorm quite a few different ways that you can um, come up with this construction as well using different constraints. So say you wanted to use this particular constraint in order to enforce the shuffle gadget truth. And um, you can actually use our API to implement that and I'll walk you through how. So here um, we have a two shuffle function and it takes in a constraint system and the variables A, B, C, and D. What you want to do is to enforce these constraints on the variables. So first you get x, uh, on line six you say x is a challenge scalar with a certain tag, the shuffle challenge. So now you have this random challenge scalar. And then you say on line eight, you multiply in the constraint system a minus x and b minus x. And that will allocate variables, one variable for a minus x, one variable for b minus x, and one variable for the output. So now you have a minus x times b minus x equals input mole. And then uh, on line 11, you have c minus x times d minus x equals output mole. So now what you want to do is set input mole as equal to output mole. And you can do that by making a linear constraint, input mole minus output mole. And um, the constraint system enforces that to be equal to 0. So on line 12, we say constrain input mole minus output mole. And that basically constrains that input mole is equal to output mole. Uh, cool. So hopefully you see here how with three constraints, uh, two, multiplication, two multiplication constraints and one linear constraint, you actually create the equation we have here, a minus x times b minus x equals c minus x times d minus x. Cool. So that's actually like hopefully super easy, super easy to use API. 
Um, and now if you're a prover and you want to make a proof that this statement is true, what you do is you simply allocate variables A, B, C, and D using your secrets. And then you pass the variables and your constraint system, here the constraint system is called the prover, into the two shuffle function on line 12. So you pass the prover and A, B, C, and D variables into the function that we just saw before. And then this function will add constraints to the constraint system that enforces that A, B, C, and D have certain relationships to each other that guarantee that they have to be you know, valid permutations of each other or else the proof fails. And then you create a proof by just calling proof, prover.proof. So hopefully also super straightforward. And then the verifier is actually a little bit easier because the verifier doesn't have these secret scalars. It takes the commitments passed to it by the prover, A, B, C, and D commitments, and allocates variables from those. And then it passes those variables into the two shuffle function in the exact same way that the prover does. So at this point, the prover and the verifier should have the exact same set of constraints. And then the verifier calls dot verify on the proof. And if the proof is a valid proof over the inputs, and the verifier and prover have the exact same constraint system set up, which they should because they both called the same two shuffle function, then the proof will verify correctly. Uh, and actually, this is all working code. You can see the full sample code and running tests uh, at this GitHub link here. Cool, so as a recap, I explained to you what constraint system proofs are, why we even care about constraints. I showed you the API for making multiplicative constraints and making linear constraints. I talked really briefly about some a protocol extension we made for making challenges from the constraint system, such that you can actually make the proofs semi-interactive. And then I walked you through a shuffle gadget that uses the constraint API and uses the challenges to make a shuffle gadget. So hopefully that's super cool and illustrates that it's actually not that hard to make you know, constraints. It's really just like one line per constraint and you call it directly into the API. So now that we have this like pretty cool library, uh, we decided that we wanted to build a um, more complex protocol over it. And more specifically, we wanted to build confidential assets. So confidential assets is basically a way to have a bunch of inputs and outputs where you don't know what the input values or output values are. You also don't know what the input uh, asset types and output asset types are, but you want to be able to prove that the transaction is valid. So no money was created or destroyed. Um, so basically confidential multi-asset blockchain applications. So in Cloak, which is how, what we named our confidential assets protocol, uh, you actually use a bunch of small gadgets and you piece them together. So the first gadget is the shuffle gadget, which I had showed you earlier. I showed you earlier a two input, two output shuffle gadget, but here it's an in input and output shuffle gadget. Then you have a merge gadget, a split gadget, and a range proof gadget, and the range proof is a proof that the value is in a certain range, zero to two to the n, and this sort of doubles as our proof that the value is not negative. Uh, it's important to make sure that the value is not negative because if you had um, the ability to have a negative output, you could say have a $3 input and a negative $3 output and a $6 output, and that would you know, somehow work out, and that's not good. So we wanna make sure that no values are actually negative. So this is what a cloak transaction looks like for three inputs and three outputs. Uh, to an observer and to a verifier, this is exactly what you see. You see some blinded inputs, blinded outputs, and these gadgets in the middle. You can't actually tell what um, the movement of the inputs and outputs through these gadgets are though. Only the prover knows where the values are modified or moved. So I'll show you how the prover constructs a valid proof that the inputs lead to the outputs in a valid way. So first, uh, the prover actually knows the secret inputs and secret outputs, of course they have to, uh, since they're making the proof. And they want to first use a shuffle gadget to randomly, um, to order the input types by their asset types. So you wanna reorder it so the dollar amounts are together uh, and the yuan is sort of at the bottom. Then you want to merge all of the values of the same asset type. So $5 and $4 get merged into $9. Then you want to shuffle these values again so that all of the non-zero values are at the very top. So here we're moving the $9 sort of to the top of the dollar asset group. Then you wanna split the $9 into $6 and $3 um, because that's your target output amount. You can see the outputs, uh, we sort of want three yen, $6 and $3 there. 
And then lastly, you do a random shuffling just so that you have the outputs in the desired order that you want, um, so that you don't have the, um, so you add a little bit of randomness there. And then lastly, you want to add a range check that basically proves that none of your output values are negative, just so you don't you know, end up creating money out of nothing. So that's exactly what the prover does, and that's what the prover puts into this um, sort of cloak protocol proof uh, to show that all of these movements were valid uh, movements of money. And then it makes this proof, it sends it over to the verifier, and this is all the verifier sees, but the verifier can actually run the proof and check that it's a valid transaction without having to know exactly what the input values and input asset types are that are being transacted. So um, this allows for the transactions of the same size, so three input, three output transactions would, would all be indistinguishable from each other. Uh, and we actually fully implemented this using our Bulletproof's constraint system API and the spec and code are over here. And I just want to add a note that um, it actually seems really complex, but in terms of performance, most of the performance, um, most of the cost in performance is actually from the range proofs. And so um, for those of you who are familiar with confidential transactions versus confidential assets, confidential transactions is a way to have a confidential blockchain with only one asset type. And confidential transactions also require range checks because they have a similar requirement that you're not creating money out of nothing. And so in order to make a confidential assets protocol, we actually see we still need the range checks and the additional logic that we add on is not actually that much more expensive. And so in, per, in, in terms of performance, you actually get a confidential assets protocol that has very similar performance to a confidential transaction protocol, but can handle multiple assets. So that's pretty cool uh, performance wise. All right, so I've given you several examples now of sort of like custom handmade contracts where we had to like determine what we wanted to make a proof for and sort of like dive in and tweak the math a little bit in order to make it work. So I, I told you how we can do that for a range proof. I told you how we can do that for a shuffle gadget. And I told you how we can do that for the whole cloak protocol. But it would be really cool if you could write like zero knowledge smart contracts without having to like dive into the math and sort of tweak additions and multiplications. And so that's actually what my team is working on now. We're making a zero knowledge smart contract language that's sort of like an abstracted higher level programming language for making zero knowledge contracts. Um, it's called ZKVM because it's the zero knowledge virtual machine. So um, previously uh, my team at Chain worked on TXVM which is a transaction virtual machine. And the goal of this TXVM programming language was to give you the deterministic results of Bitcoin, but give you the expressiveness, the way to um, write flexible contracts of Ethereum, and also give you a safety, uh, so the like no foot gun properties of Bitcoin. So we designed TXVM, and now we're actually just adding confidentiality to TXVM by using Bulletproof's um, uh, constraint system proofs. So that's why we call it ZKVM. So to expand a little further, because ZKVM is sort of taking concepts, concepts from TXVM and adding bulletproofs to it, maybe I should tell you a little bit about what those concepts are. Uh, TXVM uses linear value and contract types that have a law of conservation. So it's literally not possible to create more value out of nothing or to uh, delete contracts within uh, your smart contract language because the programming language won't allow you to do that. Also, contracts implement an object capabilities pattern, and you do state updates for, uh, via this output deterministic transaction log. And so this gives you the, the safety properties of the language while still giving you flexibility to write interesting smart contracts. And what we get with bulletproofs is the ability to operate for all of these different operations in TXVM. Now we can operate over encrypted values and contracts. So before, we could say value A plus value B equals value C. Whereas with bulletproofs, with um, adding bulletproofs into the design, now we can do computations like the commitment to A plus the commitment to B has to be the commitment to C. And then you just add that constraint over, a, B, um, over the commitments to A, B, and C to this constraint system proof. And then at the very end, make a proof that all of those relationships are valid. Bulletproofs also allows us to build arbitrary custom constraints using the constraint system protocol. And you can have protected asset flow using cloak, so no one can map inputs to outputs. Uh, so this is actually currently under design, and uh, we're sort of uh, asking for uh, community uh, involvement, and so you can actually see uh, our GitHub 
link and we have open issues with like this is a good first issue that you can contribute to um, and I think that's like super fun and uh, interesting uh, development in terms of um, adding capabilities to existing smart contract languages. So uh, as a recap, I started out by telling you what zero-knowledge proofs are in general. I explained one specific kind of zero-knowledge proof, uh, which is the bulletproof zero-knowledge proof protocol. And then I explained uh, how we can do a range proof and how we can do a constraint system proof using bulletproofs. And lastly, um, I explain how we implemented a confidential assets protocol, which we named Cloak. Um, I explain about our zero knowledge smart contract language called ZKVM that we're working on currently. And I added this sort of question mark box because I think there's actually a lot of really interesting applications that you can do using uh, constraint system proofs because it's really open ended. Anything that's you know programmable, um, anything that can be represented as a um, arithmetic circuit, anything that's NP complete, you can also uh, represent as a constraint system and you can make a proof for it. So we're really looking forward to seeing what the community builds using this constraint system proof protocol and also using eventually our zero knowledge smart contract language. Um, so that's sort of an introduction to all of the stuff we've been working on. And if you want to read further, uh, I have I had a very short amount of time to explain a lot of things, so there's probably like a lot of questions that you have um, that can be answered by the Bulletproofs paper, or you can go to our notes at doc.dalek.rs or docinternal.dalek.rs for details about the cryptography implementation for the Bulletproofs library. Or if you want to learn more about Cloak and ZKVM, basically projects that Interstellar is working on, you can go to the protocol page at Interstellar. So those are some more resources. And if you have questions, um, you can message me on Twitter. That's my handle. And that's everything I got. Thank you.